It's my very pleasant uh, job to introduce Mark, our speaker. Now, uh, many of you will know Mark already, of course, very well through Christchurch and before Christchurch, Pedley Baptist Church, along with the city of BBC here today. Many of you will also know Mark indirectly through his films and TV, one of which we, we see this clip from now. Now, because Mark, back in 2001, gave up his uh, safe teaching job to uh, follow his really, really strongly believe was his God-given dream of, of working in film and TV. Before that, in 1993, probably still in his short trousers, and uh, he uh, had already designed his first feature film called White Angel. Remember that one, Mark, I'm yeah, sure? It's a bit like This Is Your Life, isn't it? Um, since 2001, he has done all sorts of things. He's art directed Big Fat Quiz for Channel 4. He's art directed Comic Relief on, on BBC One. First Men in the Moon for BBC TV. He co-produced, designed, award-winning feature film Sus, S-U-S, Sus, um, which after its release was, was on um, BBC Two just over a year ago. He's produced a number of short films, including One of Us, which won uh, Best Drama in Los Angeles in 2007. He designed Going Up, and that was Going Up, we just saw then, wasn't it? Yep. Designed Going Up, another short film, which was Best Drama at the uh, Reed International Film Competition last year. Another short film he just recently uh, designed tells the story of Rahab, the prostitute in the uh, book of uh, Joshua in the Bible. Mark has his own production company called uh, Creative Hub with a number of projects currently in development. He has this great heart, as many of you will know, uh, for men, uh, particularly for how men can support each other, how we can support each other at work. And he's going to talk a bit about that today, uh, challenging us to get out of our comfort zones. He's also concerned with what he calls the spiritual secular divide has actually hindered the spread of the gospel. Again, he's going to come on to that. He's been a member of Christchurch now for two and a half years. He's married to Ka uh, Karen, and he has two sons aged uh, 15 and 12. Could you turn your mobiles off? I must have turned mine off. The last time I uh, <laughs> publicly spoke, I was doing a uh, speech at a friend of mine's wedding. And uh, halfway through the wedding, the phone went off from a friend of mine who were looking after our children who were a lot younger. And there was this panic phone call of uh, how do you get the how do you get the uh, pushchair down and all the baby kit into into this particular car that they had at the time. So that was rather embarrassing. So I turned my mom. My wife has said that I'm addicted to my mobile phone and that when I sadly or actually joyously die and go to be with Jesus that she's wondering about burying this with me. Uh, the coffin will be in the shape of a blackberry. <laughs> Which actually is an important thing first to say to you guys is that we, a number of us in this room of a certain generation, we love our tools, we need our tools. We need our tools to communicate, we need our tools to do our particular jobs. And one thing that, just to say off, totally off the cuff, is that the first thing we need to start doing and I used to do it, I've stopped doing it, but I need to start doing it again. Which is we need to start texting each other and telling each other what we're up to. And I know that's something that I've seen that email bit, it's so brilliant. We need to start connecting with each other. We need to start emailing with each other. Or more importantly, if we find that difficult, we need to start talking to each other and explaining what is going on in our lives. And I leave talking last, which is rather interesting, because very often we hide behind these machines. I'm not really a Facebook fan, even though I'm on there. But when people ask me to be a friend on Facebook, and they can't be bothered to actually phone me up and ask me how I am, I have a few issues with that. And so I'm sure are you. In this room are some of the most talented people I know. In this room we have a broad section of skills from an amazing furniture maker to an amazing lorry driver to people that have worked insurance in all their lives to people that design software to people that work in the banking industry to people that work in the building industry whether that is 
from being a surveillance quantity surveyors, of providing other IT support, okay, from people who, <coughs> excuse me, would say that they are retired, and I don't believe that there's any such thing as retirement in the Kingdom of God, who used to be in the oil industry. There are bus drivers, there are people that um, run their own software companies designing chip and pin. There are people that uh, used to be in uh, the health industry as management or engineers or providing maintenance for hospitals. There is a broad section of skills. Then there are other people, there are carpenters, there are art directors, there are filmmakers. There are people that are uh, civil servants, there are people that are given a lot of their lives to working in job centres, giving advice to people coming in for money or trying to seek to get a job. There are photographers in this room, there are painters in this room, there are decorators in this room. I could go on, there are people that work for the Salvation Army in this room. <coughs> there are retired, if they ever are, vicars in this room who have spent a lot of years battling for what's right. So the amount of talent in this room is incredible. And you are an awesome bunch of people, even though on a Saturday morning you may not exactly feel like that. <laughs> I'm curious that every time I come to either talk about some of these issues, whether that's individually or with other friends of mine, Steve Turner being one, that all hell breaks loose. It is a battle. The Bible talks about the fact that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against principalities and powers and rulers and darkness. It makes that very plain in Ephesians 6. Over the last week, without being dramatic, I have fundamentally felt that. I've either been laid up, I've been laid up in bed with flu, other members of the family have got it ill, I've had enough self-doubt to last a lifetime, and here I am going to challenge you to get out of your boat and get out of your comfort zone. And I have struggled with that, thinking, why should I say that, when actually I feel as though I'm sinking. But I am going to say it. And the reason I'm going to say it is because I passionately believe that our nation needs us to get out of that boat and to start to do the things that we're called to do. So for some lunatic reason, in 2001, I decided to leave a very safe teaching job. I'd had a, I'd been in the building industry on and off before then. There was a number of different things that I've done in life. I was an apprentice cabinet maker when I was 16 years of age. In 1997, I, um, I was in a meeting and this is the first sort of lesson of how we can begin to support each other. But I was in a, a meeting with a good friend of mine, with Steve Turner, and we were listening to this guy who was challenging us and saying about, to some extent, maybe getting out of our comfort zone. What was on Steve's heart was to change his job. What was on my heart, having done my first feature film in 1993, and, and uh, I then went on to do a teaching degree and scared that having done that out of my wife because I just thought, well actually I'm going to go and make films, darling. I don't want this sensible thing. <laughs> um, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I went and trained to be a teacher and had that adventure that's something that I always had and would always use. So Steve and I were in this meeting and we were challenged and he said I want to step out, I want to start my own uh, business in regards to Chip and Pin and I said well actually I want to get into the film industry uh, and TV full time, I want to do more of that. Going back in 1987, the words are really, really important. In 1987, I was found myself in Peru and a friend of mine who I was out there with, I was working for Tearphone, reminded me of the conversation that I'd had with him over the fact that I just felt one day I would end up working in the film and television industry. I'd forgotten about that, and six years later it happened, and only a few years ago reminded me about that. Our dreams and our passions are what really, really 
makes us come alive are fundamentally important to who we are. And we have to explore those <coughs> with all our might. So Steve and I began to pray. And we would regularly text each other and we would regularly have that conversation. Um, and things have evolved. And we, I can honestly stand here and say that I have gone on to do what I said that I would do. Steve could stand here and say that he has gone on to do what he said that he would do. And that was on his heart. <coughs> it has not been easy. Both of us would put our hand up and say it has not been easy. Easy. It's something that he and I are going to work at, which is to pray more together. It's something that hasn't happened as much as it should have done over a period of time. And we've had that conversation. <coughs> and that's partly, and it has to be acknowledged, because I don't go to his church anymore. That's documented. It wasn't an easy time, it was a painful time. But we left. But what is on my heart, it's not about building different separate empires or separate churches. It's galvanising men together, whatever their background, wherever they are from, and saying we have to seek God and we have to build his kingdom in where we are. And one of the big problems I feel is that what we do for a living, they do. If there are Christians at the top of Morgan Stanley, then Morgan Stanley may have decided to have not waited to pay their bonuses to get the tax in regard to the tax, but actually to pay the tax that they should be paying. Our lives is 100% missional. Our work is not separate from what we do on a Sunday. What we're called to do in our lives is our mission. That is what we should get on and do. And that is what you guys need supporting. It's not separate. And if we begin to analyse that, and that's why I say about the secular and the spiritual divine, if we begin to analyse this, sadly we come down to this. And a wonderful man called Mark Green of the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity says it better than me. So let's just put my hand up in here. Because before I get fired at and accused of being heretical or undermining the institutional church, God forbid that I would do that. <laughs> there are people that are out there that are saying things, are contextualising it better than me. It's just I suddenly realised that I was saying the same thing. But they had beautifully put it down in a pamphlet. And Mark Green wrote a pamphlet called The Great Divide. And uh, it's here. So a friend of mine gave it to me and said, uh, Mark, you could have written this. I said, I read it. And I read it. I thought, you're right, I could have written this. He's come to a conclusion that 2% of Christians who are in full-time Christian work are, we're supposedly saying, well, they're spreading the gospel. It's as though they're these special, holier-than-thou people that are doing this amazing, amazing job, right? And some, and very often, they are doing, of course, an amazing job. So, I just want to quote this. The secular spiritual divide leads us to believe that really holy people become missionaries. Moderately holy people become pastors. And people who are not much use to God get a job. Bar humbug, of course, this is not something that missionaries or pastors themselves believe or would indeed ever say. But the reality is that a majority of Christians do have a sense that they are second class citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Because what they do is not valued. So, you are valued. What you do for a living is profoundly important. That's your mission. That's what you've got to get on and do. And we look at the state of our country, we look at the state of the world, and the reason why is because we're not getting on and doing it. Now maybe I'm a frustrated MP. Whether I stand for UKIP in the next election is another thing. <laughs> but the point I want to make is, of course, some people go, oh dear. Well that's just 
throw this controversial issue out there. The, issue, the thing is, is that unless we engage with politics, unless we engage with all these things, then we have no right to moan about where we are actually at. So let's go back, let's just quickly look at the media. <coughs> Obviously, the media is the most influential cultural tool that we have. Whether we're watching that on uh, TV, or <coughs> watching that uh, on the internet, or we're going to the cinema, or whatever. You, we have grown up in a time where we have seen dramatic change. Some of you remember, um, some of you have been in, uh, in IT all your lives, so have most probably been through one IT change after another. So we've been through the 286, the 386, the 486, the 586, the 686, the Pentium 1, the Pentium 2, computer. <coughs> <coughs> the equivalent of the Industrial Revolution every single 18 months. No wonder some of us are absolutely knackered thinking what's going to happen next. It's tiring. We now have the processing power in here is to the equivalent of whatever I think, you know, when they stuck Apollo up on the moon. It's the processing power in here. We are carrying this kind of stuff all the time. So the media is streaming stuff at us. So let's look at Hollywood. In 1910 in California, Hollywood, but just, just before then, Hollywood was a barren land. There were six amazing families, Jewish families that were thrown out of Russia, that didn't know each other, that ended up in America. <coughs> One of them, families being the Bozorsky, who, which became Warner Brothers. So they were thrown out. They ended up in New York. At that time, a lot of people thought that the centre of the film industry was either going to be New, New York, Berlin, or London. They never expected it to be Los Angeles. And that's partly because Thomas Edison went, I don't want you lot here. You might accuse it of being anti-Semitism and a few other issues. So they ended up going towards California. At that time, the <coughs> church, a church in that area who owned a lot of land said, you can have the land, you can build the film industry as long as you build the church. Now some of this is anecdotal, some of this is definitely true. So California, I think, is twice the size of the UK. And suddenly, millions of people started moving in. So by 1920, the industry took off. And we then had people like Cecil B. DeMille making amazing movies. And Cecil B. DeMille, a wonderful Jewish man, would have his Old Testament by his bed, would be reading it, and that's where he got his inspiration from for certain stories. What said is the next step. By the 1930s, the church in the area started to get a bit of window. And it started to say that the film industry was full of a den of vipers, that it didn't want members of their churches to go and engage with the industry, and was actually preaching against the film industry. So, Warner Brothers per se, heard of this, so they wrote a letter to all the church leaders. Send all your Christian writers, send all your Christian actors, send all your Christian producers. We want you engaging in our industry. So all the church leaders in the area said, we'd rather hell freeze over. <clears throat> and that makes me profoundly sad. <clears throat> because we missed an opportunity. We would rather listen and separate ourselves than engage in an industry that has the biggest tool to communicate to so many people around the world. <clears throat> but we do have heroes. I have heroes. You have heroes in your industry. So I'm going to talk about a couple of heroes now in the in industry that I'm trying to engage with. And then I'm going to an, uh, one particular hero and completely unrela and unrelated to indus industry in regard to the media. So, in 1921, 
there was an advert for a job. And uh, to be, basically to head up the BBC, a Scottish guy called Lord Reith applied. Lord Reith was the first director general of the BBC. Lord Reith, a committed Christian. In Bush House, in Upper Regent Street, they've just spent millions of pounds doing up a, a new building. But in Bush House, as you enter there, is the following statement. This temple of the arts and muses is dedicated to Almighty God by the first governors in the year of our law, 1931. John Reith being Director General. And they pray that the good seed sown may bring forth good harvest, that all things foul or hostile to peace may be banished hence, and that the people inclining their ear to whatever things are lovely and honest, and whatsoever things are of good report, may tread the path of virtue and wisdom. I bet there are some people in this room that didn't even know that that was in that building. In 1938, Lord Reith resigned. What's fascinating is why he resigned. He resigned because of the criticism of the BBC of their coverage of the Spanish Civil War. Nothing has changed. The sex doc, doc, doc comes to mind over a recent war invasion. Nothing has changed. But between 1921 and 1938, Lord Reith, and it has to be said, bless him, he didn't think television was going to be successful. Because remember, when the BBC started, it was radio. It was radio. <coughs> he put values into the BBC that are Christian. I would suggest to you, there is no doubt about it, it's documented, he all, uh, he, the managers, etc. <coughs> you had to be mad, you couldn't be divorced. There were standards that he set. Every single manager would have been interviewed, would have gone through a certain process. So by 1938, there was an undergirding of certain values. Television took off. And then suddenly, of course, as you know, with the Queen's coronation, uh, that was the big event that launched a, the mass media of people in the street going to watch the Queen being coronated. Lord Reith, when he resigned, was sad because he felt that um, his own particular work was not finished. It's very interesting, the, the history of the Radio Times, just quickly. The Radio Times, we've all, you've all grown, we've all grown up with it. We've all thought, oh, it's an issue, you know, it's the television programme. Mm -hmm. He, newspapers, the Radio Times came about because he couldn't get listings of all the radio programmes into, into, new, local, into the newspaper. Newspapers refused. So we started the Radio Times. Let's move on to another hero <coughs> of mine. <coughs> Arthur Rake, a committed Christian, who came from the Rake Hovis McDougall family. So there is no doubt about it, he came from uh, a little bit of money. Thank you very much. That's really kind. He came from a little bit of money, to say the least. His father was rather unhelpful because his father said to his son, you will never ever amount to anything. He basically said you're useless. In the early 30s, he started making short films for Sunday school. So he could tell stories and that then evolved. By 1946 to 48, 52, he had the most integrated distribution, filmmaking, um, 
training of future young actors and actresses that we're never seeing. It was actually, you could say, technically bigger than Hollywood. We had this. And it was, Pinewood was built. And this industry started. Now I'm sure that a number of you know who Arthur Rank is. Arthur Rank came from, a, I think there's a Methodist background there. What amazes me is when I talk about that, and I know that people go, well, I never knew that Arthur Rank was committed to Christian, I never knew that young Pinewood, I never knew all this happened. I last year had the privilege, I think Rob Buckley was with me, when we went round to Pinewood and uh, we went to see Rahab and there was a tour. And what thrilled me is that the woman who was doing the tour mentioned Arthur Rank and indirectly mentioned that there was this sort of Christian faith and was trying to push this out of the way and not talk about it. But it was mentioned. So God has sown seeds in the industry. And there are, you know, God's kingdom is at Pinewood. It's just that we as ambassadors haven't gone in there too much to revive it. And that's what we need to do, wherever we are put and whatever we are doing. So let's move on to another character, just quickly. In the building industry, I think around about 1917, there was a man called Lang. I've forgotten his first name. John. Sorry? John. John Lang. And thank you. So it's Lang's the Builders. <coughs> around about 19, 1917, he was building a dike. It was a big dike project that he was doing. And it was going wrong. And it was going very badly wrong. So, as we often do in these situations, we sometimes go, Okay, God, if you would help me sort this out, I will commit my life to you. And I will follow you. So he did. And God came through. And the dike job was sorted out. And John Lane took off spiritually like a rocket. And he created Lane's The Builders. As Esther, Esther 4 talked about, you know, being born for such a time as this. He was born for such a time as this. Lang, one of Lang's projects was to be responsible for building the Mulberry Harbors during the Second World War, all those concrete blocks that were floated over the, for um, a Normandy invasion, and he oversaw that project. He oversaw going round uh, to make sure that every single time we had a runway bombed, that they would be repaired quickly. He was part of all of that infrastructure. And he was a deeply committed Christian. And he would teach in Sunday school on a Sunday morning, religiously. In the right word of that, use of that word. He would drive to Sunday school in his Rolls Royce. And there is a, a lovely anecdotal story of him hooting someone. They thought he was hooting to get out of the way, but actually he was hooting to say, do you want to live in my car? I don't care who you are. I'm nothing special. I've just been blessed with this lovely car. Can I give you a lift? What's interesting and what is sad also about Lang as a company, I think a few years ago they were sold for a pound, weren't they? Is that God doesn't have any grandchildren. I'm not sure what totally happened, but there was a bit of a panic at the top of maybe some of the family and bits of the company start being sold off. But because Christ is not at the centre of whoever's running that company, sadly it's disappeared. So these are our, our heroes. These are people that are doing amazing, have done amazing things. But so can you. And you are heroes too. The problem is, is that we may not actually believe that. We may not believe that we have an important contribution to make. In a way, my sort of final point is this. 
is how do we start to improve that? How do we start to connect ourselves? I had a shock recently when I suddenly thought I've reached the age of 49. I don't feel like it. I have felt like that at about 150 over the last week. And there is no doubt about it, some of you might have felt like this morning when I dragged you out of bed to come and be bored senseless by me for about 20 minutes. And I'm thinking, where has I become a Christian at 18 and 49? What's happened? Where's it gone? What have I been doing? And in many ways, I feel I've just started to get going. We have to work our way out, and I'm very grateful that there is one person in this room that's nowhere near the age of 49, that we have a young person in this room, and I'm very grateful for that. <coughs> and I'm sad that more younger people aren't in here, and I'm not going to pick on you. But what we've got to do is, whatever, however old we are, whatever we're doing, whether we think that there is a definition of retirement, I don't think there is a definition of retirement, we need to start connecting with these young people. We need to start saying to them, what are your dreams, what are your passions? How can we pray into your life and get you from here to here? What are we actually doing? Another controversial statement could be said that for a number of us that retirement, we then think retirement is, oh brilliant, I've got a massive amount of time I can spend all my time doing certain church activities and programs. Maybe we need to think that through. Because what would be great if some of you could get on a train and go and visit those people that are in what we would call employed work. Start to regularly meet with them and say, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for your industry? How can I pray for your business? How can I pray for your children? And we need to start sowing the seeds of the future. We need to start saying to our children, uh, my eldest, who shockingly will be 16 in a few weeks' time, would like to be a vet. So our challenge is, one, thinking, how is that going to be paid for? But the other challenge is, is praying into that. He also has a, an acting ability, some of you have seen it. Byron's the same. It's like, how do we pray into this? How do we start saying, what are your dreams? What are your passions? Let's start connecting. A few weeks ago, uh, myself and Rachel Sanderson of our church had, had a bit of an epiphany moment. We've been running this thing called Film Club, where it's an excuse for us to show films. And then we would then be able to have a discussion afterwards. And we suddenly realised it wasn't about evangelism. It was actually connecting all the different generations. And I had the thrill of seeing the youthful Peter Renee and Pat in the same group as Tom Griffiths' son, the Sanderson kids, me, Rachel and Tom, all having a discussion and all valuing what the opinions are and what was going on. And it was quite a moment. And it isn't about evangelism. It's about how we are then connecting with each other. So, I need to stop in a few minutes on one level. Or how am I doing for time? Great test of times and questions. That's what I want to do. You could Good. wind up in the middle of the there's a load of stuff that I've thrown out there, and I do, we do want to have time to connect for uh, questions. But really what is on my heart, the last sort of message, is working out how do we connect up. We look at our church life, and we see that it's so compartmentalised. And I don't believe it's supposed to be like that. So just quickly, we look at Jesus modelling it with 12 disciples, living with 12 blokes from fishermen to tax collectors to accountants. A mixture of people. 
And that comes back to my point about of who we are. An extra tin or an extra packet, particularly of the nutritional sort. So uh, just a little plug on that before we thank you for a lovely day. Thank you for two seconds. I realise. Thank you, ladies, very much indeed. Um, I realise we're off to.